What's going on guys? Joe Munoz, OneStepPrep.com in yet another video that has to do with descent planning. Hope you all are doing well and your family's doing well. I have behind me here a video of a very interesting little predicament that you can find yourself in when it comes to descent planning where the aircraft is essentially porpoising like this. It doesn't know whether it should go for following the path or should it go for the speed or should it go for the path. And this is a great illustration of this, and I'm going to explain it all in detail, hopefully, so that you walk away with a very clear understanding of what we're seeing here. Now, behind me, we're going to see a descent on an arrival where there is a speed constraint, and we're also following the descent path. I'm going to roll a clip here, and better yet, what I'm going to do is put it up on your screen so it looks even more clear and crisp for you. And what you see is on the right by the altimeter, we're descending out of 22,000, 500 feet or so, and the path is getting a little bit away from us. We're kind of high on this approach. Descending at 275 knots as targeted by the magenta triangle, you can see that uh, we have plus five uh, on the upper end of the speed spectrum there. That's the little magenta line that's tough to see because it's under the yellow line, but then we also have minus 20 on the lower end. And so ultimately the jet here is in a position where we're slightly high, and you can see that the rate of descent is about 2,000 feet per minute as it dives to try to get that descent path. But then it quickly speeds up outside of the plus five tolerance. So the vertical speed uh, is less aggressive and it brings the nose up to regain the speed back. And in doing so, a less aggressive rate of descent, it kind of loses the vertical path even more. Now it gets the airspeed back, but then it ends up, so now it dives back down to get the path. Now what you're witnessing here is effectively the airplane uh, trying to do its best to stay on the path, but then it quickly overspeeds the maximum amount of velocity that we can have in the descent, the airspeed here. So then it brings the nose up to get the airspeed back within an acceptable range, and then it quickly realizes it's slightly high on the path, so it dives back down, and before you know it, you end up kind of in this porpoising motion of the airplane prioritizing uh, first path, and then speed, and then path, and then speed. Okay, so. How does this happen? Why do we end up in this situation? How do we fix this, okay? And how do we ensure that we ultimately try not to get these situations? Now, ugh, I have here a handy dandy whiteboard. I love drawing. I think it, looking at things visually does a lot for our comprehension and retention. So I'm gonna do my best to hold the board and draw at the same time. So here is your jet. Okay, and we are descending on this path. Now, basically what we just saw is that the aircraft first descended fairly aggressively, but then it quickly began to overspeed a little bit. So it's brought the nose up and then it got back inside that acceptable tolerance and then it brought the nose down, all right? And then it started to catch the path, but then it oversped again, so it brought the nose up. And so rather than have this nice path coming down, ideally at idle thrust, we end up with this not so decent, uh, not constant rate of descent all the way down on our arrival. Now, the way you find yourself in this setup is usually one of two things has happened, okay? Number one, a air traffic control has probably descended you relatively late. So rather than giving you a, uh, a proper top of descent uh, point clearance, so rather than have reached your top of descent in a timely fashion, been issued a clearance to get down, they kept you high. And so now you find yourself over here and you are high on what should, this should have been your path and you're now slightly high. Now, when I see that I am being held up kind of high and they're not issuing, issuing me a descent clearance, now the first thing I'm gonna do is ask them for a descent clearance. Hey, any chance for lower? But the next thing I'll certainly do, probably simultaneously, is slow down. I'm gonna to start to slow down, assuming I can, and there's no speed constraint. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because rather than have, let's say 275 was the targeted speed there, I'd rather pull the speed back to say 250 knots, all right, 250. This is assuming you don't have a speed constraint and 250 is a safe airspeed for you to be operating at, okay? So assuming those are both true, I'm gonna do that. And then what, when I finally do get issued the descent clearance, I can descend a lot more aggressively to rejoin this path because I have 25 knots that I've already slowed down so now I can, I can speed back up in the descent with a more aggressive rate of descent to get down. Now, 
Maybe I'm sharing something with you that you don't already know. Oh, that's kind of obvious, Joe. And frankly, for those of you that have been flying for any length of time in jets, that's probably pretty obvious. But I'm going to get to the second part now, which is maybe the thing you didn't think about. Sometimes you end up in this setup because there is a lack of wind entered into the McDo. So your, FM, your, your flight management guidance computer did not have the proper descent winds, and you likely have a tailwind. Now, you'll remember I just did another video on descent planning. And the descent planning video very much said that I need to take ground speed times five to give me the approximate foot per minute rate of descent to maintain the calculated path. Well, the reality of it is, if you don't enter your descent winds into the McDo, then it may not have an actual accurate rate of descent needed because your ground speed is gonna be higher than what your automation factored. Because now all of a sudden, let's say you have a 50 knot tailwind. I mean, a 50 knot tailwind would mean I need an extra 250 feet per minute to stay on a descending path compared to say a no wind situation. Either that or I'm gonna to have to start an earlier descent, one of the two. Now you don't need to figure it out yourself, you have the automation to do it, but the point is that ultimately the automation only works as good as the inputs. And if you put either a wrong input or none to begin with, because you don't put any wind information in there, then you end up in a situation where the airplane's doing its best. It's trying, it's trying to get down and meet your constraint, both speed and altitude but maybe it just doesn't have the tools to do so. So now how do we rectify this? Okay, we saw the issue. We saw the two potential causes, late descent clearance or also a lack of descent when entered into the McDo. So how do we rectify this if this happens to be the case? Simple speed brake is probably the best tool in your tool bag at this current moment. And what I would very much do, if you see your airspeed approaching the top of that airspeed limit like that, it's probably a good time for you to use your speed brake especially if you're having a hard time maintaining the descent path because quickly, yes, the airplane is prioritizing the path, the descent path, that's its priority. But that priority becomes not the priority, it becomes secondary if it sees that it's gonna exceed the airspeed. And so ultimately what I'm trying to do is by use of spoiler extension, I'm trying to help it to not have a speed exceedance so that it doesn't enter speed recovery mode, which is where it brings the nose up and applies a lesser rate of descent to recover that speed into an acceptable uh, tolerance amount so that we can then go and regain this descent path. But ultimately, you end up porpoising, and unless you intervene somehow, probably by use of spoilers, you're really gonna find yourself in a scenario where you end up with a somewhat uncomfortable and certainly not constant rate of descent. Now, your descent path that the airplane is following, by the way, may need to be updated. And there are many ways to update your descent path. And the reality of it is, unless you have FMS2 installed, your descent path will not continually recalculate itself. It'll effectively cement or solidify a descent path from the moment that you're in the cruise phase of the McDo, and now you enter into the descent phase. And once you're in the descent phase, that descent path that was originally calculated is effectively solidified and cemented in the airplane, whether it truly is high or not, will show what it thinks it is reference to the originally calculated path. I know that sounds like a lot. Probably seems a little bit confusing, and I guess it can be. But ultimately, there are ways that you can force it to recalculate the path if you're an FMS-1. If you're an FMS-2, you don't really need to worry about it because the airplane does it for you. It's a great tool to have. But what are the various ways to force it to recalculate a descent path so that you end up with a jet that's truly looking at an accurate descent as opposed to maybe one that's no longer accurate because it calculated it at a time, at a place, at a moment where there were different conditions, a different scenario that may have changed now, right? Different ways to do it. I do talk about it in our energy management program. It's available online at onestepprep.com. These are things, folks, that for those of you that are flying professionally and take this craft seriously, I would very much recommend you invest in yourself to understand these things. There's no uh, greater feeling than you being a passenger on an airplane knowing that your pilot is fully invested in their craft and they take it seriously and they know all these things that are happening with their jet. Imagine getting on board an airplane and you're having to wonder to what degree of competency. Do they know all these little tips and tricks and, and, and there's many of them. 
And so the main thing is not that you have to be in a position that you know them all. The main thing is that you're in a position that you're a student, a lifelong student. Because as long as you're a student, you're a receiver. And as long as you're a receiver, you'll continually You'll have more, which puts you in a position to give more, puts you in a position to be more useful, and it puts you in a position to ultimately fly more competently and also more confidently. All right, hope we can help you here at OneStepPrep.com and hope this video made sense and hopefully you got something out of it. Look forward to working with you here in Miami. Come do your ATP, CTP with us or your type rating. Maybe reach out so you can do some video courseware with us or reach out if you want to work one-on-one -on -one with myself in some kind of personal development, coaching, mentorship, fitness, all kinds of other things I'm involved in at onestepprep.net. We'll see you in another video. We'll see you here in Miami.